Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join us tonight. We have Portland artists for Teresa Rayford. I'm so honored to present to you Teresa Rayford, who, as you know, is running for Portland mayor. Mm -hmm. she, Teresa has been uh, tirelessly working to create change within our community. Uh, it all started after the death of her nephew, who was tragically a victim of gun violence. And that really catapulted her into this, um, into this path of holding our leaders accountable because there was no accountability for his murder. And um, that has led her to broadening that, um, that spectrum into um, trying to articulate so many different issues that we have within government institutions and trying to identify um, all the resources and um, solutions from a root cause. Uh, so we are so honored and we would be so um, grateful if you did um, become our mayor and was truly able to create change from the top down. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I believe that is possible. I do my research and community engagement is the resource that city, the city of Portland has been missing in order to be more progressive. So I'm excited for you know, the opportunity to build us forward. Thank you for bringing us here. And thank you, Catherine, for today. Thank yeah. you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so yeah, I'd like to introduce Catherine Feeney, who um, has been a musician most of her life. And she has been a solo recording artist for the past 20 years. Um, I think you, she has uh, five albums. Something uh, like that. <laughs> 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 And one of which uh, she recorded after um, she went to the protests at Occupy Wall Street in uh, 2011, I believe it was. Um, that's a really good album. I suggest you check it out. Um, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited to be here. Um, I, I am learning more about Teresa um, as the days go by um, and just, feel like she is such a brave and bold leader. Um, I know that she has um, been through some really hard things and is more effective um, for it, it seems, um, is just seems like strong, honest, authentic. Um, and I think yeah. Uh, she's the kind of leader that we need in Portland right now. Um, you know, reading, reading some of the, um, some of the platform on Teresa's website today, it was just, um, driving home to me how, um, how as much as Portland is a city of, um, sort of progressive lifestyle, um, in many ways, um, policy hasn't reflected that. Um, especially um, when you look at the, la the way development has happened in the city um, over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and it would be so wonderful to have someone uh, in the mayoral office who is really representing people who haven't been at the table for the most part in the conversations that are happening and the decisions that are being made. So thank you for for running for Mayor Teresa, it's really hard, I imagine, and the pandemic has not made it easier. So um, we appreciate you. Uh oh, you're muted. I didn't want to keep <laughs> on making sound effects while you were talking. I was getting. <laughs> I mean, I, I got a lot of power from the Occupy movement in regards to mm -hmm. learning how to build coalitions and doing solidarity work and really understanding the meaning of holding leaders accountable. So this is full circle for me. I'm, I'm literally just blown away and thankful because the service that we get from the politicians that we elect should be on <laughs> making sound should be exactly the same vision of what we wanted when we started this struggle. So thank you for being here. I hope we get there. My pleasure. Yeah. And thank you folks who are tuning in to um, be a part of this. Super exciting. Um, sh should I play some songs? Yes, we're very okay. <laughs> Cool. Um, this is my first 
my first remote concert and I'm really quite nervous. <laughs> I always get nervous before shows, so that's nothing new, but um, this is a song I haven't, I, ha I haven't played live a lot, um, but I thought it felt particularly, um, particularly, I should turn off my, oh, my, the rhyme ringer's off, okay. Uh, I thought it felt particularly appropriate to this, um, to this event, so it's called White Flight. take off these headphones because I realize that I don't need them because no one's talking to me right now and I really couldn't hear myself um so I don't know what you guys are going through but um I have found this super difficult this um this uh lockdown um that's been happening in much of our country um 
and I haven't been directly affected by a coronavirus. So my heart goes out and my prayers go out to those people who have been directly affected by it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a super social person. And so, uh, and I, and I didn't even realize how much I relied on my social connections before this. Um, so it's been really challenging and with a, a young child at home and him not being able to see his friends, all those things are hard. Um, but obviously, um, it could be way harder. So, uh, I'm grateful, um, for my health and my family's health. Um, and I, I, uh, hope that you folks who are watching, um, are healthy and are, um, remembering to feel gratitude in the midst of this, um, what is really, really hard, hard time. Um, this is a song um, that I wrote many years ago. Um, and recently it was featured in um, the show Bojack Horseman, which was like um, just a total gift um, that, you know, I couldn't have anticipated. Um, and it goes like this. I think I'm going to sit down for this one. Oh, sorry. me uh till a couple seconds into that song to realize that i could be i could look at the camera and then i would be looking at you <laughs> i was like ah, i don't want to stare at myself while i play um oh just fyi um anna who um introduced um teresa and myself um is getting any messages that you're sending by youtube so um, if you are um, sending messages or requests or anything, my apologies, but um, I, I'm, I, 
don't have access to those at this point. Um, so I just, I have a, a few more songs I'm gonna play um, that I have planned already. Um, I do hope to do another um, show sometime soon online. Um, so uh, you can let me know requests for the next show. Um, this is a song um, called Afraid that I actually wrote in, um, um, I think I, 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 for a while I was part of a, a song a week club um, where a bunch of us would um, send our songs in. Um, we were kind of all over the country and we, there would be like an, a, a phrase that we had to base our song around. And I don't remember what the phrase was for this one, um, but this is the song that came that week. play one more song um, just on my own and then I'm going to play a song that I hope you would join me on um, and if there are any of you folks who um, 
have instruments that you want to grab. Um, it's going to be in the key of C, um, and it's a song you've uh, most likely heard before. Not the next song, but the song after. So in case you need to go get um, your guitar or whatever, um, you could do that now and just miss a little bit of the next song that I'm going to play. Um, so uh, I'm going to play another another song from the um, Catherine Feeney and Christopher Janitas album. Um, and this one, uh, many of the lyrics come from a poem that was written by a young woman um, in a Write Around Portland workshop. Write Around Portland is a really cool organization that um, does writing sh workshops in um, prisons and detention centers and sort of non-traditional spaces. Um, and uh, I loved the words that this, this young poet wrote. Um, and uh, so thank you for that inspiration wherever you are. Um, it's called, I don't know if I am. They say I'm funny, alive and they say I bring everyone that I meet a big smile. But they also say I make bad choices. I listen to the foolish voices. I don't know why I ran. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I am. I don't know if I am. They say I'm cute, kind on the eyes. What they don't know is I don't love myself. So in the night I cry. They say I'm smart. They say I'm fun. If I'm so smart, tell me why did I, why did I steal that gun? Oh, they also say I make bad choices. I listen to the stupid voices. I don't know why I ran. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I am. I don't know if I am. They say I'm fun. I thought that it would be too. When in reality, it was the dumbest that I could do. They say I'm a good girl. God give a life in a bad. So um, the next song that I want to sing um, that I hope you'll um, sing with me and play with me if you uh, have an instrument or play an instrument um, is Amazing Grace. And it's a song that um, I just think is one of the loveliest songs um, ever written. And um, I, um, my husband and I sang it at our wedding um, and it's just um, very meaningful. And I think... Um, I was, I was singing it um, before. Uh, so yeah, you might want to look up the lyrics if you, you don't know them um, while I'm talking. <laughs> um, I, was, I was singing it um, kind of getting ready for tonight and um, the, the lyric that's, um, I once was blind and now I see, um, just really struck me that it feel, I feel like on a daily basis, I'm sort of blind and, and then hopefully at some point during the day, I also see, um, but it's just a 
continuous process of um, messing up and then trying to do better um, in the way that we love each other. Um, yeah, so join me in this if you would. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first be. Many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe as far, and grace will guide us home. Let's do the first verse again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound to saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now. Thank you. I hope um, I hope that you sung, and I hope that uh, that felt good. Um, I'm, we're gonna uh, have a little conversation here. Um, I'm gonna learn more about Teresa, which I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, I, I'll put my headphones back on so I can hear you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. That was I, gotcha. a I couldn't you. help but think Thanks. about how, uh, sometimes I, I like history. I'm always talking about it, but some of it is still with us right now. Like that song, people are feeling those words right now today and everything that yeah. we're dealing with. Like we shouldn't, in a pandemic, you're worried about a loss of life, but you're not worried about uh, our society um, creating that obstacle for us, right? We're looking at it being a part of the COVID crisis, but we're not looking at um, hate as being a motivator for violence right now. So um, reminding us through that song and through the struggles from that past, um, I think it's, you know, it's timely. Thank you. I know some families that needed that. So Thank that, you. Because it's uh, affirmation that you understand and that, I mean, like you said, you're still learning. Yeah. We need people to know what we're going through and to deal with that and to process it. And yeah, I mean, and whether the inequities in the healthcare system that are making healthcare more accessible to some people than others, whether those are intentional or not, they're real and we need to confront them. Yes, yes. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So what matters to you in, in our community? I know when we first started, we were talking and I know you're a two year, you have a two year old yeah. and you love children. I got a two year old grandson. Oh, nice. So I'm going to be spending time with them over the next couple of days and still doing this stuff. But yeah. how, are, you know, how is life at home with the baby? I know they're like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, where are my friends, dude? Like, why can't I see them? Um, 
so yeah, he gets, he gets frustrated and he gets sad. Um, but you know, we're, as I said, we're super lucky and, um, it's just, you know, it's hard. learning to be adaptable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I was really interested, Teresa, to ask you, um, I know that you have personal experience of the foster care system um, in Portland, and I myself was a foster parent previously. Um, and I, I, you know, obviously that system is incredibly stressed um, and has been for a number of years in our city. Um, and I'm, I was wondering um, if you had ideas of just how to um, make it better. Yeah. Well, the, th- the thing is, is that um, when we went into foster care, it was in the it was in the 70s and we had just passed the Indigenous Child Welfare Act and the leaders in our community um, didn't partner with the communities that were pushing for that legislation to provide protection for families that were of Indigenous communities um, in regards to having access to our children, because we already knew that we were living in Portland and state of Oregon was built on a white supremacist ideology. So um, you could literally be um, the response to your children coming to school hungry or, you know, not having good shoes or whatever could trigger an investigation and you could lose your children. So families have worked to to offset that impact and to provide protection for tribal communities, children. And they were also seeking to be, you know, in reliance and, and solidarity with my community, but we took the level of community policing because I think that um, we had already been traumatized through slavery and through the plantations and that whole ideology of fitting in space to where we didn't mind doing assimilation rather than resistance when it came to protecting our families. And so in the asset base of that programming, there's um, there's no real resources for families that are developed. So let's say that when I went into foster care and you know there were family members that should have had access to us, but there were not enough appropriate resources to balance that out. And then even when we were staying with different people that knew our families, those risk of harm factors, like you can't have access to the family. Well, sometimes again, that helps to build the transition for that foster family and that, ki- and that child that lives in that community so that whatever they're going through in the transition in that home, they're not feeling like they're the reason they're there. Cause usually it's something that happened with the parent and the child is a victim in all of this. And the caretaking of the guardian needs to be supported by family members that are in alignment with the values and the needs of the child that maybe just don't have the resources to help them. But in our system, we're so concerned about a risk of harm that we might alienate those opportunities rather than um, build them in to build that that transition for someone like yourself that would have like a kid like me, who's like, my mom's in jail, my dad's gone, my brother and sister are somewhere we've been harmed or abused. And now we're coming into your home that to you, it might feel like, hey, this is comforting and you have your own bed and here's where the food is. And are you okay? But to the child, you know, your baby, if someone takes your child right now, um, you and your child are going through some severe trauma. And the fact that there's nothing in that system to help build the relationship for that family that's receiving that trauma, um, like as if just having the warm bed is going to be the fix, that, that alienates us from our real empathy in regards to making sure that that family is notified for that child. As a child that grew up in foster care, a lot of my friends committed suicide. Um, a mm-hmm. lot of my friends, and including my sister, were you know had a baby at 12 years old because there was someone in the home that was assaulting and sexually violating the children that lived in that house. Um, we didn't have a voice even. We would get the word from our social worker that if we wanted to be together and we didn't want to be you know dis- displaced from each other that we needed to just figure out ways to get along. And again, that's the eighties and the, you know, and all that, but we're we're still in 2020 and we still have children living in foster homes uh, that don't have the accommodations they need. We have uh, police officers that are riding them around in the back of cars and putting them up in hotel rooms. Uh, We don't have the accommodation for the transition out of that system when you turn 18 years old. And even when we do have it, we don't have enough education around it to help support that child. My thought in regards to guardianship 
Help me be ready to fill out a job application. Help me be ready to transition into my own home. Help me feel that the need to educate and graduate is an essential part of me being able to get my brothers and sisters in a home where we can all be taken care of. Those, those older uh, kids, you know, they really are, you know, should be impacted. And I'm working with a lot of youth now that are like, we want to be able to vote. Well, I remember we were in foster care during the time that I wanted to vote. I thought I was smart. I could actually be, you know, on my own, but we didn't have the resources to take care of each other and we were doing it anyway. So we, in my opinion, we have to build policy that is built around sustainable practices that communities do anyway when they're not mandatory reporters and having to refer something to policing rather than resources, right? Um, I have a lot of teachers that are like, I really could have supported this child that got taken away um, had I been able to give them food or ask the parent if there was a need for food. And now we have food pantries, but that doesn't make up for all those families, for all those generations that were disenfranchised. So I just want to build in real life systems that look at the differences that are happening in our community and right. rely on that to help the families transition, including the foster family. Right. So you're intervening when a family is struggling to put food on the table, not when you're taking the child out of the home. Absolutely. I mean, well, yeah. we have to have those practical safety nets and everybody sure. should know about them. Yeah, sure. But yeah, but it's like, you know, if you can, if you can help a family to relieve stress before it gets to the point that there are like explosive violent events, yeah, um, you have better outcomes. Well, obviously. I've talked to, to some of my friends, like um, I have a couple of different friends from different communities and their culture is different than our communities, right? Um, like my community, we're all yelling at each other all the time, but we're not going to get physical because <laughs> right. we don't want <laughs> right. violence. Right. And in some communities that's happening. But when you have real bias and real racism in your communities, people mm -hmm. can be offset just that you live there. And then if you're a loud family, that could feel violent to them. And if they're able to articulate that threat or anything, um, it becomes an impact of what's happening with that family. And that's why I said, you know, if we family first, these opportunities, if we notice things and instead of being a, a reporter, we're like, hey, we're, we're able, like so many, I mean, judges, district attorneys, teachers, social workers are like, I wish I could do this because that would be more impactful. I have people that are like yourself that have been foster parents, but have related to the family and even adopted children that they knew were never going to go back. But because that the only reason it was possible was because they had a relationship with the family. Mm -hmm. um, and it made it easier for everybody, including other brothers and sisters. I'm thinking about the whole, I was the oldest out of 11 kids. So you can imagine I had kids running up on me all the time talking about, you're my sister. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, like literally. So yeah. um, it's sad because that is the society we live in. And when you look at the parents that are from my generation and even the immediate generation after mine, those children did not have their own families. And when you're who you can rely on, it is stressful. And if we plan for that, um, I think it would be less stressful and we wouldn't have the outcomes that we have now, but we mm -hmm. don't plan for that. We criminalize it as part of the whole policing effort rather than care. So mm -hmm. we can do better. Yeah. Um, I, kn I know a little bit about um, you founding Don't Shoot Portland, but I'm curious, like, um, if you would um, describe the moment when you decided to run for mayor and oh, what kind of yeah. catalyzed that decision. Yes. Um, so I started Don't Shoot Portland in 2016 after my acquittal because I had been arrested for protesting and I was on trial for four days and I was found not guilty. So I figured, you know, this is gonna have to go into another court. I'm gonna go ahead and start a foundation for legal support for families. And that's what I did with Don't Shoot. I took the active organizing that community was coalition building with um, and turned it into a, a infrastructure for legal support and advocacy for families. And so um, in doing that, I was like, yes, this is my space. I actually have something that I can commit with, um, commit to that can actually bring honor to our community and my nephew, um, because I set it up as a nonprofit. So it you know, goes to the public as a benefit. And then of course, you know, 
just being able to impact so many people through a design of a business that is actually functioning like a protest would, seeking accountability, civic participation, justice, economics, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, but the first, I, I, I supported uh, Ted. You know, I, I got acquitted in April of that year and then he was elected in May. And so I had hope because I gave him my vote. Um, and then we got to, let's say, fast track September of 2016. And um, there was a protest. We were protesting SROs in the schools because kids didn't want them in the schools. And that wasn't the last year when there was the couple of students before. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we were protesting and we ended up walking all the way downtown from the Northeast Portland precinct. And we got downtown, we went to, um, to City Hall <laughs> and we were complaining, we wanted to make a complaint to Charlie Hills and to the Independent Police Review that some police officers tried to interfere with our protest. Because of course, since I got acquitted, I'm thinking I can protest anywhere. They know <laughs> I assume and all this stuff. Yeah. But they stopped, they tried to stop us. So we went to tell the mayor and when we got there, um, his staff were saying, well, he's you know speaking to the union and some other people. And I was like, oh, what are they working on? They were like, oh, they're building a draft for the collective bargaining agreement. And I was like, what? Well, hold on, wait. Because um, one of the reasons that I supported Ted was because he said that he would build community engagement around the collective bargaining agreement. And the biggest impact that that police uh, collective bargaining agreement can bring is community engagement so that all those families who had lost their children to police violence, so that people like myself, whose nephew um, was, you know, Someone uh, was a first responder, but they didn't have AED device. They didn't have a tourniquet, so they couldn't save his life. So that was my plea. There were so many different reasons why community needed to impact this, this agreement. And so Ted had made that promise when he was running for office. So him being the mayor elect in October of 2016, it was our thought that, hey, they're fast tracking this, uh, Ted you know, they're fast tracking this collective bargaining agreement. You're the mayor elect, let people know that that's a problem because one of your promises to the public was that we would participate and it wasn't due for signing until June of 2017. So we mm. found out on September 23rd, uh, we stopped it from happening for about three weeks and then they fast tracked it anyway, signed it. And during all that time, Ted never stood up or came. He would contact me, um, through text and through his people that were running his campaign and he would ask for meetings. But I kept telling him, you have to make a substantial statement to the public to say that you're on, on agreement with this because we have the Sierra Club, we have the ACLU, we have like all of these big agencies and organizations that are saying this is not okay. And we're not hearing from who, the person who's gonna be the mayor of our city. And so he hid and he, you know, skeeted out, never made any public statements. And then, of course, January of 2020, I mean, uh, January of 2017, he became mayor. And immediately, every promise that he made to us about houselessness, about all these critical engagements that he was going to make so that we could focus on issues, um, everything just went out the door. He didn't, he, I mean, Qantas Hayes got murdered in February. I think seven people died in January on the street. Like, and he was not addressing these issues. So I think it was at that time, um, in my mind personally, that I was going to run for mayor. I was like, you know what? This is just crazy. Everybody I back keeps letting us down from the state to the county to the city. And even though I've run for office before, I did it because I wanted to know how their process works so I could hold them accountable from a level of let me do that research. Let me put myself in your shoes. Let me work through understanding what this process means so I can be an ally for you. But in, in believing that we're allies because I've run for office and you know that my practical experience is helping me engage with communities to help you make better influence decisions. There was still resistance. There was still resistance. So it was like, wow, not only are you lying, but you're not even in and you're not even interested in having a conversation with me and you chased me down for coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In December mm -hmm. of that year, when I, when I tweeted that, it was, it was a promise to him. It was like, don't wake up in January and think you're gonna be the mayor of the city for the next three years. People are gonna know that you're gonna do things for the people because I'm gonna be on your butt. You know what I'm saying? And I tweeted him and I sent out the tweet and it was like, Ted, um, you know, I hope you don't think about running for mayor because I'm gonna need you to get out of my seat. And <laughs> went, 
sleep, woke up, and every morning when I wake up, I'm, of course, I'm looking at Twitter because it has the news, mm-hmm. and I'm trending. And I'm like, this <laughs> about Schaefer. Like, why am I trending? What happened? Did Bernie Sanders tweet on me again or something? <laughs> Um, and it wasn't a Bernie Sanders tweet. It was my tweet. And mm-hmm. it was a now this video. And uh, I was like, wow, I don't even know who did this. They went and found pictures and the information they were saying was true. And then I saw it, it went viral. So I didn't want my community who was already saying fire Ted resign and everything else to feel like we were stuck with him. I wanted people to be motivated um, to doing things collectively that could give us better outcomes, even though we felt let down. Mm-hmm. I didn't want people to just be like, I can't wait till he leaves. I, I wanted them to have hope. So I was like, hey, I'm going to run for office. And then people were like, yes, let's go. And, um, you know, I've said it before, we had 69 volunteers, then we had 600 volunteers. And right now we still have people signing up to support. And I think it's the same momentum we had every time we struggled against our education system or our criminal justice system or, you know, our housing systems. Like, we are literally building the leadership that we need in this community. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity because I don't know how else to continue serving Mm. um, our needs. Like it's not practical to continue, um, you know, hoping that our leaders will uh, will see us. Yeah. Um, Anna, do you have some questions from the Well, I want to just remind our viewers about the voting process. So um, the ballots are due May 19th. You, so you can drop them off at different drop-off sites on May 19th. If you want to mail it in, you mail it in by May 14th. And the way that the Oregon, um, th- this next vote works is that it's the primary, which means um, that if no one, if not, if n- not a single candidate gets more than 50%, then the top two will advance to November. So we're uh-huh. hoping that that, yeah. We're hoping that Teresa will just get over 50% and then it's just done. If not, then um, we're, we're going to keep going. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the other thing for um, I would like for our viewers to know is that if you would like to donate to the campaign, there's a button below in the description. We also have a lineup of other musicians coming um, in the net for the next week. So. Yeah. But please just share that with your friends. And um, also, this is your chance to get to know more about Teresa and her platform uh, so that you can get to know her and also tell your neighbors and your friends and family. So please, uh, if you have a specific issue or question, write it in the online chat. You have to sign into YouTube to be able to utilize that. But um, please do that. And then I have some personal questions, but Catherine, I'd love for you to ask me. <laughs> well, Anna, Anna has been um, telling me, uh, Anna and I are friends, and she, and she was, I was sort of asking her about the, um, the work that she'd been doing um, around infill. Um, and I, I guess I'm curious, um, do you feel like there is a way to balance um, increasing density in Portland? with keeping housing accessible um, to lower income people? Again, I believe that that comes to the will of our leaders because a lot of the current leaders and the the past leaders have given us these promises, but they're unkept. And even when we feel like we're getting exactly what we think we are, like, oh, this is gonna be affordable. It's affordable for who? It's affordable for who? My daughter moved out here from Colorado her and her friend who had been renting a big giant house out there, they can't afford to live in Portland. We got teachers that live here that, I mean, that don't live here, that work here, that are, you know, like affordable for who? Yeah. Um, who's, who's sitting on these committees? What, what promises can we trust? Where is the clarity in the actions? Every time I get this question, it's like answering a question that you know is connected to some type of racketeering. Um, It's hard to say what's actually what when there is no sustainable cost for action. There's literally no investment in communities of color. So we can't keep saying that we want to make affordable housing so that people can reconnect into their communities. 
Um, we're not saying that for immigrant communities to say that we want to build sustainable families uh, spaces for their families, because a lot of the families I know, the biggest thing they're talking to me about housing is that our family can't fit into that space. Right. You know, and they're over policing those spaces and those spaces are not accommodating our family. Mm -hmm. So what do we do for a family like mine? Like it's not even a conversation that they want to have because they literally want to live together so they can afford to live in Portland. And so um, I, it's just, I, the whole thing is that I, I want to bring in audits. I literally, I'm, I'm hanging out with so many different attorneys and hoping that we get this seat so that we can work with whoever is going to be our next secretary of state and see if we can get some real lines of communication on what's what in all of these policies and all of these different bureaus and committees that they're putting together. Because even in the design of some of these boards, you would think that in the bylaws, there wouldn't be a monetary value for some of the participants, but it still remains that there are these partnerships that seem to me um, kind of nepotistic or whatever. So I just, I want to clear everything out. I want to be able to see where so we are. So you're saying kind of like developers are making decisions on like every, how every, development should happen in Portland. They're making decisions. They have more seats at the table. Mm -hmm. um, we were on a forum the other night with NAMCO, with some of the National Association of Minority Contractors, and a conversation about uh, Prosper Portland had come up, right? And we already know that in our communities, it's like, oh no, they're gonna come and gentrify us and say that it's called urban renewal because we know what displacement feels like. We have the evidence, we have you know, generations of that being called different things. Um, we say rip to me, it, it literally means rip, you know? Um, but but we, need, we need more substantiative education and we need very serious engagement. And what I wanna do is I literally wanna stop our development until we can kind of identify who's actually developing here, where the money is coming from and what our true intentions are because we can't continue going this way. Out of the last three mayors, we have so many different cities in one, like you cannot roll down any communities in Portland and see like good character design. Mm, you know what yeah. I'm saying? There's too many different yeah. designs and everything looks really chaotic. And that is uh, for a place where we're known in our nation for unhealthy, depressed people, unhoused people, just seeing that and being inundated with it, empty housing everywhere. I live downtown, there's so much empty housing around me and we're not trying to even figure out ways to accommodate the unhoused community in those spaces. So I don't trust anything that we say that has the words a fair, affordable um, or accessible in regards to housing, because there are ways for us to provide that now. And even without the pandemic, um, we could have been making provisions we haven't. We need a mayor that's gonna invest in real housing solutions and what that actually should and would look like if we were intentional in housing communities. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, I'm running because I don't trust City Hall. I'm sorry, I'm like, yeah, I don't trust anything. I watch those videos on YouTube and even the people that are on the committees don't have enough information. There's so many arguments. Mm. I'm like, whoa, this is so, a <laughs> So do you, I know that sometimes it's, or I've understood, I don't know direct, from direct experience, but I've understood from folks that sometimes it's difficult to transition from being um, a protester to being like within the system because um, things that you can see are wrong. It's just not as um, not straightforward to change them because as you said, things have become very, very complicated and very um, kind of, the power structure is kind of like spread out and, and it's a mix of private and public. And so like, if you are, if you distrust city hall, do you, feel like you're going to be able to um, like build enough positive relationships to make fundamental change? Absolutely. Um, one of the reasons that I even became a protester was because the media called me a protester. My nephew died <laughs> and I started auditing policy. That was literally what became my activism. They were like local activists, thrust raper. And I was like, what is an activist? And I would be so insulted by that because I did business development for a CPA for 15 years. So I understood the process of bureaucratic systems, right? That was like my day job. And so for my nephew to die and for me to see that there was some type of uh, 
like racketeering in regards to why those services weren't coming in. There wasn't a managed system that was effectively uh, solid in regards to what it wanted to get for an outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, like, you're, so you're kind of saying like there's money coming in, but we can't tell where it's going. Well, exactly. and it was and it was this. Let's say that he died in gun violence, and let's say that I'm talking about the gang task force, and let's say that there were 70 agencies, including Lipstick, including the JTTF, including you know like the sheriff's, Multnomah County Health Department, TriMet, education systems, and for 25 years they're getting anywhere from 10 to 20 million dollars to identify. Let and let's talk about the black population in Portland, like we. We all know it's less than three percent right so that's a lot of money that you're spending to identify criminals and to project who's going to occupy these beds in the juvenile system and so mm-hmm. um the fact that that much money was managed through those systems and was not being invested in housing and education and jobs um and then we say those people did not involve or engage themselves and i'm those people and I know that you, they never came to talk to us about community planning when they were gentrifying the community and putting investments in there. And I know that when people were losing their businesses after the PDC gave them investment money, it was because the storefront looks great. And of course, you met your quota in identifying inclusivity and diversity, but you actually didn't give them an investment for some of the administrative costs. And you're not investing in the education they need because their model and role of being a proprietor is based on knowing how to do stuff but not literally knowing how to manage stuff. So that fake opportunity you gave them is because money for that. And so all of our intentions that we know are going to get us funding because we're intentionally wanting to connect to these neighborhoods Mm -hmm. for somebody from those communities that has lost loved ones that have lost their community, that have lost their children and actually know what that system looks like when it's built to function correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why it became a protest because I saw it. And when I demanded audits through my protest, I wanted the community that was telling me that they needed advocacy to be the proprietors of receiving that information so that they could see how powerful they were. They'd be like, wow, I did a three minute testimony and now all of a sudden I have this information. And I was like, yeah, now teach your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so that was my protest was to be an educator. Um, and, And that's why I'm running for mayor. If I was just some person that wanted to kick you know, rocks in the street, I would let somebody <laughs> pay me to write a book about protesting or I would sell art to protest, but I sell art to pay legal fees for people. Mm-hmm. I'm helping people file lawsuits and get the Department of Justice to file investigations so that we can get things right because I do not trust the leaders we have. Mm-hmm. Um, and not because I think they're malicious people, but because right. they're trying to make a system that does not work for us work mm-hmm. for them for mm-hmm. us. <laughs> and that is exploitation. It's like, no, yeah. you can resist that. We yeah. elect you to resist. <laughs> yeah. You thank know? you. Yeah, yeah, well, thank yeah. Thank you for that question. I'm, I'm, I know I'm long-winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's cool. That's great. Um, I probably have to tuck my son in. <laughs> so <laughs> I, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Teresa, for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And please remember to go and get your ballots in. Yes. Okay. yes. okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night.